friends, when we look at the Catholic Church, what do we see? Well, if we go to Rome, we will see the Vatican and the great Basilica of St. Peter's, which is built over the very tomb of St. Peter. We'll see the Holy Father, the Pope, who is the head of this organization of the Catholic Church which spreads throughout the world. And he has his card his he has his college of cardinals who advise him and help him in the running of the Catholic Church. And the church throughout the world is divided into archdioceses and dioceses with archbishops and bishops, and then even further into parishes with parish priests, and even further into missions and outstations. And this is a mighty organization. There are many universities and colleges and schools and hospitals and homes for the aged and homes for all kinds of ch challenged people. And there is a chain of command from the Holy Father, the Pope, down to the last in a mission. There is hardly any comparable organization in the world today. And this organization of the Catholic Church has been going on for 2,000 years. And this is what we see when we look at the Catholic Church. Something wonderful. It has preserved learning throughout the, throughout the ages. But my friends, I want to tell you that what we see is not actually the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is something which we actually cannot see because the Catholic Church is first and foremost Jesus Christ. We join the organization of the Catholic Church by getting baptized. All ba people baptized in the Catholic Church are members of the Catholic Church. But we to really to really join the catholic church we have to meet jesus we have to come to know jesus because jesus is the heart and the soul of the catholic church There have been many great leaders, great religious figures in the history of the human race. We can think of Socrates in Greece. We can think of Confucius in China. And of more recent days, we can think of Martin Luther King in America, or Nelson Mandela in South Africa, or even in our own country, we can think of Mahatma Gandhi. And Jesus also is a great figure of history. No one has brought about the change in history and the change in the way we live and think, as did Jesus, whom we call Christ. 
But you may say, unrightly, we admire Mahatma Gandhi. We admire Socrates. But how can we meet them? They are dead and gone. It is impossible to meet them. We remember them and we revere them, but we cannot meet them. And the question therefore arises, how can we possibly meet Jesus? Because Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. He is a historical person. Just like the other great leaders and great religious figures of the world. They are historical figures too, but they are also figures of history. Their time has come and gone. Then what about Jesus? How, what is the difference between them and Jesus? The difference, my friends, is that although Jesus lived in this world like everybody else, we know where he was born. We know uh, more or less, we know where he lived also, and more or less we know what he did, and we know how he died. So he is a historical person, truly born, truly lived, and he also died. We know where he lived, we know what he did, we know how he died. And in this, he is like all the other great figures of history. But here comes the difference. Jesus rose again from the dead. Jesus died and rose again. And death has no more control over him. So Jesus is the risen Lord. And this makes him the greatest person in the human race. He is the head of the human race because he is the only one of all the human race who died but then rose from the dead and came back to his disciples. And it is because Jesus is living today that we are able to meet him, that we are able to experience him. He is the same today as he was yesterday and as he will be tomorrow. Jesus is the risen Lord. And so, my friends, this is why it is possible for us to meet him. I'm not saying that we will meet him, but because he has risen from the dead and has promised always to be with us, then we are able to meet him if we know how. He said to his disciples as they were going on the way to Jerusalem, you see, he said, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. 
they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the foreigners, the Romans. And they will make fun of him. They will spit on him. They will scourge him. And finally, they will kill him. But three days later, he will rise again. Jesus kept his word. He rose again and he remains with us today. is a historical person, not someone born in ages past about whom no one knows anything exactly. No, he was born. How long ago? More or less 2,023 years ago. He lived and he died like every other human being. But unlike any other human being, he conquered death and rose again on the third day. And he sent his apostles and disciples throughout the world to proclaim that he is Lord. And those who believe in him will have their sins forgiven and will be given eternal life with God. This is the good news that he has proclaimed. Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Learn from me, because I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Peace in this life and eternal happiness in the next. This is the gift of Jesus, and this is what the Catholic Church was founded to proclaim and to dispense to everyone who believes. And so, my friends, the structures of the Catholic Church, the Vatican, the dioceses, the bishops, the archbishops, the parishes, the colleges, the schools, and everything in this international organization is for one purpose only, and that is to bring us to the experience of Jesus, to know Jesus and to experience him. Can we experience Jesus? We can't see him, and we can't touch him, and we can't hear him. Then how can we experience him, you may say? Well, if we look at St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 21, we will discover how we can experience Jesus. Jesus is speaking at the Last Supper to his disciples, and he says, Whoever accepts 
and keeps my commandments. Whoever accepts and keeps my commandments is the one who loves me. So, do I love Jesus? Then I should look at my life. Do I accept and keep his commandments? If I do, then there is love for Jesus in my heart. If he loves me, Jesus says, he will also be loved by my Father. I too shall love him and show myself clearly to him. So here we have the means by which we can experience Jesus. We must accept him. Therefore, we must meet him. We must know him. And we must love him. And if we love him, we will keep his commandments. And then the Father will love us. And Jesus, loving us, will show himself clearly to us. So we can then experience Jesus. And Jesus can enter then into our lives. Another person coming into our lives and transforming us from within. We saw that to join the external, visible organization of the church, we must get baptized. But we need more than the external baptism of water. We need the baptism of the heart. And knowing, loving, and obeying Jesus is the baptism of the heart. All the same, we cannot see Jesus. Only the twelve apostles and the first disciples saw Jesus. They were the eyewitnesses of Jesus from the time he was baptized in the river Jordan until the time he was taken from us into the eternal glory of God. They are the eyewitnesses and they are our witnesses too. So they have witnessed to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And humanly speaking, our faith is based upon their witness. And even from a human point of view, the witness of the first disciples is true. And we know it is true because they guaranteed their witness by shedding their blood, every one of them. They shed their blood for the sake of the risen Lord, rather than deny that Jesus was risen from the dead, the, the apostles, Maybe St. John alone lived to an old age. But all the other apostles, they guaranteed their witness by shedding their blood for Jesus. And as Jesus himself said, no greater love can be shown than to give your life, your only life, for the one you love. And they gave you their only life for the truth. They gave their only life 
to guarantee the truth of the witness they gave. But, my friends, there is another witness beyond the apostles. It is the witness of the Holy Spirit of God. We read in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verse 7, that Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. He says, speaking again at the Last Supper, he says, Indeed, believe me, it is better for you that I go away. Better for you that I leave this world. That word shattered the disciples. They were filled with sorrow when, Jesus, when they heard that Jesus was going to die. But he says, it is better for you that I go away. I am going away and then I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And he says, I still have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And he will give you my message. He will help you remember all that I have said. And so the Holy Spirit is going to lead us into the whole truth. My dear, my friends, when we come to know Jesus, then, and we come, when we come to know Jesus, and love him and obey him, Jesus will send the Holy Spirit upon us. And then we will have the internal witness. We will know that Jesus is the Lord, that Jesus is the only Savior and the light of the world who gives us eternal life. And so, we must now come to know Jesus. And how, we are, how, and how are we going to know Jesus? There are four ways of knowing Jesus. And they are the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And my friends, we will go through the Gospels, walking with Jesus and coming to know him. And may God bless you. Mm -hmm.